What's going on, my good people? Mike Hidalgo here. Thank you for joining us on another FCP Euro DIY. Today, we're going to be working on a 2007 Volkswagen GTI. Today on the Mark V behind me, we're going to be covering how to do a thermostat replacement. This is going to be applicable to all the vehicles equipped with the 2.0-liter TFSI motor. Um, of course, just know on some platforms, the orientation of the block may be a little bit different. So some of the things in your way of the thermostat may change. But overall, the process is going to be pretty much straightforward for the 2.0-liter. In front of me, we have a Mala thermostat, as well as a jug of genuine coolant and an O-ring for one of the hard lines that go into our thermostat. We're not gonna be replacing the hard line, but we are gonna be replacing the O-ring. All these items are linked below and available on fcpro.com. Now, the vehicle behind us has about 238,000 miles on it. We are unsure of the history on the thermostat. Could be original for all we know. Maybe we'll find out when we pull it out, but a good telltale sign that your thermostat has gone bad is best case scenario, it is stuck open meaning the engine can't get up to temp. The heat inside the cabin may be pretty bad if you have any at all. And the car just will never get to operating temperature. It's gonna be running rich. So not the worst scenario of all. Um, on the flip side though, there is the thermostat being stuck shut, not allowing the coolant to flow through, causing your engine to overheat. Those are pretty easy telltale signs. The car does have a check engine light on. It's saying something wrong with the thermostat. So we're gonna go ahead and replace it. These are typically overlooked due to the fact that the Mark V uses a timing belt and the water pump is run off of that timing belt. So it's kind of a separate job on its own. You kind of overlook these whenever that is done. So we're gonna go ahead and replace this now, show you how that's done. But before we do that, let's take a look at some of the tools we're gonna to need for this DIY. For this job, you're gonna need your regular set of sockets and ratchets. Today we're gonna to be using a quarter inch ratchet for most of this DIY. Some key sockets to know are a 13 millimeter socket, a 10 and an eight as well as a T30, a T25, and an M5 triple square. We have this 21 millimeter socket, which we're gonna use in combination with our vise to press the bushings on the alternator out a bit. So when we reinstall that later on, it goes on easy without a fight. We're most likely gonna to need to pry it out, but we also have a hammer to see if we can try tapping the bushings back in with the bolts before we pull it out. Uh, to my left, your right here, we have Astro 94093. These are really good pliers for the constant pressure clamps. You can also use a traditional set of normal pliers to do that job as well. Um, this is a small pin that we're gonna use to lock the tensioner. You can use a uh, three millimeter Allen key to do that as well. Um, we have a 10 millimeter and a 17 millimeter wrench. Then we have a different array of picks and flathead screwdrivers. These are gonna come in handy with some O-rings, some quick clips, and a throttle body once we get to that point. Substituting a couple other flathead screwdrivers, we have a seven millimeter and eight millimeter CTA flexible driver. Something that I highly recommend is this UBU vacuum fill tool, which is also available on fcpo.com, along with the drivers and some of the other tools here. This will suck out all of the vacuum or pull all of the vacuum from the engine, which will also tell you if you have a leak or not after you do this job, before you fill the system with coolant. So it's kind of a two birds, one stone kind of situation. Super great tool. You can run this on regular uh, shop air, or you can use a small, I've used a small hot dog compressor, um, like three horsepower. That's all you really need to pull vacuum on the block. And then always nice to have is some brake clean. It helps get rid of the coolant that drips all over the place, which we know is gonna happen. And that picture here, my good people, but you're gonna need is a catch pan. And so with that, let's go ahead and get started on this DIY. All right, my good people, we are under the hood of the Mark V. First things first, before we start anything on this DIY, is gonna to be to undo our battery here. We're gonna undo the negative lead first, and then it's up to you if you wanna do the positive one as well or not, doesn't hurt. But since we're gonna be removing the alternator on this DIY, we need to make sure we have no power going to anything. 10 millimeter socket or wrench to undo the negative battery terminal. Now the nut does not have to come off all the way. This is just a pinch bolt setup here. Once it's loose, the terminal should come off no problem. Give it a light wiggle. We're just gonna go ahead and tuck it down below. And as insurance, if you'd like, we can go ahead and undo the positive terminal as well. When we install these, we'll be installing them in the reverse order at the very end. Okay, same thing. We'll just tuck that somewhere down there for now. Put this protective cap back over. And if you want, you can tuck this back up here. 
All right, now with that, we're gonna continue on over to the passenger side of the car, removing a bit of tubing. Let's get to it. So with that being said, the first thing we're gonna do is remove the cap of our expansion tank off. This will help break the vacuum seal and allow everything to flow out a little bit easier once we get to that point. And from there, we're just gonna move over and remove this upper air pipe here. We have a quick disconnect clamp up by the firewall and we have one down below in front of the throttle body. Now there is usually a piece of hardware here that holds this pipe in place. This car has lost that a long time ago. You can see part of the plastic hanging out here from that. Um, there is one more Torx bolt down here that holds it in place, which we still have, so we'll remove that. So first let's start with our right angle pick. You can use a small flathead screwdriver. I'm just gonna lift up both of the locking tabs for these quick disconnects. So we're gonna start over by the firewall, lift up our clip here. If you want, you can fully remove it. Just make sure you don't lose it. You are gonna need them again. And then we should be able to pull that free. Beautiful. And we're gonna do the same thing over here. Same thing, we'll pull it off and hole. And you know, just remember, if you have a beauty cover, they simply just pop off. Our car is missing it, so we do not have one to remove. Then we have one T30 down here. And there's usually another piece of hardware that sits right here. Again, our tab is broken off of our pipe, but it can be an eight mil bit or a Torx bit. I'm sure they have changed as the cars have aged, but just keep in mind, you should have one more there. And then we can pull this end out from this pipe and then we can fish the whole thing out. Here's that tab that's missing the other attachment for the last piece of hardware that goes here. Now we can just go ahead and set these to the side. Now while I have you over here, we're just gonna go ahead and undo this uh, clamp on our throttle body for our intake boot here. We're using a seven millimeter CTA driver, but you can use a regular flathead socket or a small seven millimeter socket, maybe in a quarter inch ratchet. These are just nice and handy to use. They're flexible. Right, that should give us more than enough room to remove this. Yeah, I'm just gonna go around, not piercing the boot here, just using the right angle to help break the seal on the throttle body. And then with that on our car, we have an AFE aftermarket intake. We're gonna go ahead and remove that. If you still have your stock air box, those typically just pop out once you undo the hose clamps in there, go ahead and do that as well. So we're just gonna remove this quickly. For those of you that do have an AFE intake, you can use a flathead on these clamps or an eight mil driver. And we're gonna stick to the CTA ones. And we're just gonna undo this elbow right here. And we'll pull the whole thing off as one. We have one very sad 10 mil bolt that holds this filter to the shield. It also holds our shield down to the battery box. So we're gonna go ahead and remove that now. Again, that's a 10 millimeter nut. Now we have the rubber grommet off, which was a bear. We had to cut it out. This AFE box or shield is held in by two T25s up against the radiator support. And we got one more on the outside of it. Again, this is really applicable to just this AFE box. You have your stock air box. Uh, they may have hose clamps or they may have those constant pressure clamps, in which case you can remove those, unplug your mass airflow sensor and pull the box out. And we can pull the shield out and set it to the side. To continue removal of this charge pipe, we have a 10 millimeter nut to undo that holds the pipe to the block. It's a little bit tight, sorry for the view here. All right, and then down below the oil cooler, we have an electrical connector to unplug as well. It's your standard connector, similar like what is located on the ignition coils. For those of you that know, you know there's a trick, which is usually push in and then pull out, but that doesn't make them any less of a bear to to do so we're going to go ahead and try undoing that now so using the flathead screwdriver i just poked at the locking tab and then i reached from behind and just pulled the whole body of the connector off now with that let's get underneath the mark 5 we'll work on the removal of that pipe and we'll drain some coolant all right my good people under the mark 5 the next step would be to remove the splash shield if your vehicle is still equipped with one ours has since long gone been missing one, as you can imagine, 200 and almost 40,000 miles. I'm surprised it looks the way it does under here. But with that said, the next thing on our list is gonna to be to continue to remove our charge pipe. So traditionally there is one more bolt that holds this pipe up against the block. 
located to the right of the oil filter housing. Our car is missing that naturally. So we're gonna continue on as if we had removed it already. Should be another T30 holding that on uh, or a 10 millimeter nut or bolt. At that point, we're gonna move over to the driver's side of the intercooler. We have one more quick disconnect clip similar to the ones we did up top. We're gonna to undo that and then work this whole pipe down. And small pick or flathead screwdriver will do the trick for these little clips. We should be able to pull this pipe back. Just be mindful, sometimes there are oil at these connections. So keep that in mind. Get a little bit there, let me grab a towel. Right, pull that off. Just avoid as much strippage as we can. And now with that, we can pull this pipe down and just work it out of the engine bay slowly. Off the stud. And now it's just kind of a tight squeeze between the oil cooler and the fans here. A little mangled on the clamp, but we can fix that when we put it back together. That just helps keep everything aligned for the clamp. Not a huge deal. So with that, let's go ahead and set this to the side. Now we're going to go ahead and undo the clamp that goes to our auxiliary pump. Again, using the Astronomatic tool. These are awesome for these style, like constant pressure clamps. Because then the pliers themselves lock. Or we can get it to lock here. And we should be able to back this clamp off along with the hose. It's fine if they come together. Not a big deal. Let's get this catch pan situated a little bit better. And then we'll just give that a few minutes to drain as best as possible. We'll come back to it and just reinstall our hose. At this point, we're just going to go ahead and reinstall our hose now that it's done leaking out. Okay, then we can remove our tool. And voila. And now with that, my good people, let's head back up top. And we're going to continue on with the next wonderful process of this DIY, which will be belt removal and alternator removal. A uh, quick tip while we're under here for those of you doing this job at home, should you want to remove the fans just to give yourself a little bit more working room, the electrical connector is down here on the driver's side by the intercooler pipe. Disconnect that, a couple T30s up top and you should be able to pull the fans out. We may do that um, should we need the room for the cameras and the GoPros, but um, just keep that in mind. Electrical connectors underneath the car, driver's side. Now back up top of things, we're going to continue on with the removal of the alternator. First, we're going to need to remove our belt or at least undo the tensioner so that we can pull it off of the alternator. For that, a 17 millimeter wrench is going to be your friend. Now, there is a way to lock this so it stays untensioned, which you can use a small. This is actually a tool or I call it a tool, but it's a pin that came off of another tensioner that we've installed in the past. I always like to save them and use them for future jobs. Otherwise, a three millimeter Allen key or Torx key will work as well. But with the 17, we're gonna put it on the head right here of the tensioner, pull this back, and then I'm just gonna to choose to lock it. Again, this is not mandatory, but it makes our lives a little bit easier, just like so. Then we can pull the belt off, and we can pretty much just let it hang out here. You can pull it off and fold if you'd like, but there's really no need to. Following the top of the alternator, there's a 10 millimeter bolt that goes into the intake manifold that just holds this hard line and soft line together. Uh, we're going to go ahead and pull that out now just to give us a little bit of wiggle room. You can use a small wrench or a small 10 millimeter socket, whichever one you have lying around. Once we remove this bolt, I always like to thread everything back into place if possible so I don't have to worry about what goes where or lose anything. So that'll give us some wiggle room here, which is great. Note, some cars have a charcoal canister located right here in front of the engine mount. Those usually just pop up. They're just held in with some compression clips. So if you have that on your car, go ahead and disconnect that now so you have some room to work with here. All right, now that we have our belt removed, we have our 10 millimeter undone from this hard line and soft line that go to the expansion tank. We're gonna work on removing the tensioner next. It's held in by three 13 millimeter bolts, two 13s up top, one at the bottom. This bottom one is gonna be pretty much impossible to see from your point of view. Uh, it's gonna be all by feel. But once we get our ratchet on it, we can work on removing it. This is going to allow us access to remove the 213s that hold the alternator in place. All 
All right, and then we have two more 13s up top, holding our tensioner in place. And we can pull our tensioner out. And again, for those of you paying really good attention, uh, when I said don't need to lock this, you do need to lock it so you can get it out. So don't listen to me, just listen to later me telling you to make sure you keep that locked. So you can get to this point, set this bad boy to the side. Now with that, we have access to the two 13 millimeter bolts that hold our alternator in place. We're gonna pull that forward a bit and then undo two electrical connections on the back of it. So don't worry about that just yet. So with that, let's go ahead and get these two 13s off. They do have a sleeved bushing on the back side of them that help press them up against the mounting bracket. What we're gonna do here first is break these free and then loosen them just a couple threads and use a small hammer to tap them back a little bit. That will allow removal of this to be easier and install later on to be easy as well. Um, you can also figure that out when it's out of the car, but using the hardware to push those bushings back makes it nice and easy when it's all in the car. So that's good there. We don't wanna pull it out all the way so that we can move up the threads by accident inside the bushing sleeve, but we want it out just enough where we have some room to allow that bushing to travel back. Just to give you an idea, this is how far the, bar, the bolt will come out before it's fully disengaged. So we have that one just disengaged a few threads, that one's all the way. So if you have it sticking out that far, don't hit it just yet. Go ahead and run it back in a bit and you'll be safe. So with that, we'll grab our hammer. To push these back a bit, we're just gonna use a pry bar and a hammer, give them a couple of taps. All right, that should be enough. We just needed to budge a little bit. If not, we can do it on the bench once we pull it out. But with that, we can pull out the two 13s the rest of the way. And while we're at it, before we try removing the alternator, there's one more 10 millimeter nut that holds the dipstick in line, as well as the bracket that holds this hard line in place. So we get rid of that. That should give us just a little bit more play doesn't hurt to remove it. I'm just gonna use a ratcheting wrench for this one, a 10 millimeter nut. So you saw, we tried um, using a hammer to get those 13s to drive those bushings out a little bit, which we'll show you once we pull the alternator out. Didn't really do much for us in this case. They've probably been in there for a very, very long time. So we'll just have to deal with them once we get it out. Just be mindful of where you pry. You don't wanna damage the alternator or any surrounding bits. So we were just prying off the casing of the alternator gently and the bracket that it sits on. So that's gonna look a little something like that. Just gonna stick this here so we don't forget about it. And then on the back side of the alternator, we have a dust cap to remove. Those can be stuck sometimes, so use a small flathead screwdriver to pop them off if you need to. And we have a 13 millimeter nut that we're gonna want to remove. This car has a stud on the back of the alternator that holds the battery cable in line. We're gonna want to remove that as well. If your car still has that, go ahead and remove it now. This is gonna be held in by an eight millimeter nut. Now back to our scheduled programming. Once you've removed that eight millimeter nut, should your car still be equipped with the stud coming off the back of the alternator for the battery cable. Now we can go ahead and pull our alternator out. Just need to massage it in a way that it will free itself from our engine bay. And then we can just go ahead and set this on the side. These are the bushings that we were trying to drive back so that when we removed it, it was easy to remove. And when we reinstall it, we're not fighting them. These get pulled through as you tighten the bolts down. So what I'm gonna do off camera is just soak these for a bit and then we'll try to drive them out a little bit, maybe using some threaded rod in the socket or a vise, depending on what we have available. Just push them in back just a little bit so that when they mount back on the bracket, uh, we don't have to fight it back on. So just keep that in mind, my good people. We'll go ahead and set this to the side for now. Now we have access to our thermostat. We can see we have three connections uh, that go to it. We have a top one with a standard constant pressure clamp, 
We have one that's held in by T30, which we're going to work on next. And we have a quick disconnect down at the bottom. There are two screws that hold this middle pipe in place. One is a T30 right here that goes directly to the thermostat. And then we have a triple square M5 on the other side, which we'll show you in just a moment. And just note, you want to have a catch fan underneath the engine once you get into this point. Uh, there is more coolant that's going to come out of here. So you want to just be prepared. You don't want to make a mess everywhere. So we have a tray underneath along with a uh, catch pan for any coolant that may come out. Now the second screw holding this in again is a M5 triple square bit. We're going to go ahead and put that on our quarter inch ratchet and remove this bolt. You can put a regular Torx bolt in here after the fact if you don't want to mess with this in the future. But from the factory, this is what they used. Again, this is located right above the oil cooler. So for those of you that have a hard time deciphering where the shot is from, it's right above the oil cooler, right below the throttle body. Now we have that M5 out. That'll give us enough play on this pipe to pry it out of the thermostat so we can disconnect that. So let's head back over to the thermostat and work on removing the three hoses going to it. Right, we're going to stop with the, start with the top hose first. I'm going to try to feed my Astro tool in here to see if I can get to that hose clamp with it. If not, we'll just switch over to traditional pliers, which might be the move in this case. I've got a sensor cable running through the front here. We are able to get it with the Astro. We just have to set it up. And now with that, we can pull the hose off. Just gonna let that drain for a little bit. Then we have the following hose underneath that was held in by a T30, the coolant pipe, when you pull that out. This is the one we're gonna be replacing the O-ring on. All right, my good people, you can see this coolant hose right here. This is the one that has a tab that is held in by the M5 triple square. The T30 up at the thermostat was for that secondary pipe which has one more surprise bolt, which we're going to show you now on our GoPro. That is another triple square M5. You can see I'm kind of soaking it a bit, uh, hitting it with a pick as recommended by my friend Corey here because their bit is not going in. I just have some penetrating fluid on it. I'm going to pick it out a little bit with a pick, and then we're going to try to get our M5 bit in there. It's just kind of corroded. A lot of debris and rust in here keeping the bit from going in. That is gonna allow us to remove that middle pipe coming off of the thermostat. And now with that removed, we can head back to the thermostat and work on prying that pipe out. And right here where my finger is, that's the seal that we're gonna be replacing. Right, and right where our coolant is dripping on, that's going to be the quick disconnect clamp that we're going to remove next. So we can get ready to do that now. Again, using a small flathead screwdriver or pick, you'll be able to get that undone. Now we're going to go ahead and disconnect the lower radiator hose that is going to our thermostat assembly. This one has a quick disconnect clip. Volkswagen really gave you all sorts of flavors. Quick disconnect, standard clamp, bolt it in, but it's all good. We're just going to use our right angle pick here to unlock this one. Again, flathead screwdriver works well as well. We're gonna wanna make sure we fish that one back out as we are gonna need it. That one just fell right here. No problem, we can add it back to our hose in just a moment. But for now, we need to free that hose from the thermostat. We're using a small pry bar to push down on the hose. These can be a bit stubborn sometimes. Those of you that do the BMW equivalent know what I'm talking about. All right, and now with that undone, we can work on removing our thermostat, which is held in by two 10 millimeter bolts. All right, my good people, and now we can work on actually pulling the thermostat off the block. All right, my good people, and with that, here is our old thermostat assembly. Again, this is a thermostat housing with a built-in thermostat. You can see the old seal stayed behind on the block. Let's give you a view of that. You wanna make sure you pull that out. Then it's gonna be a matter of cleaning everything up and getting ready to install a new one. So let's pull out that old seal first. 
And we're gonna go ahead and just use our pick to remove that seal. A new one comes with our new thermostat. And then while I have you down here, we're gonna take that old seal or O-ring off of our middle coolant pipe, if you will. That's gonna be this one right here. A small pick's gonna be your friend for this or a small flathead screwdriver. All right, now we'll grab our new seal while we're here and install that. And now I'm just gonna wipe the mating surface for the thermostat housing and then we'll get ready to feed our new one in. All right, now we're gonna go ahead and install our new thermostat. And for those of you that may have been curious, the old thermostat is and was the original at 200 and almost 40 thousand miles so really impressive obviously we don't recommend you go that long without replacing it but still really cool to know that it did that nonetheless make sure your new seal is situated on your thermostat housing before you install it lube it up with a little bit of coolant if you haven't done so already okay now we need to line up our housing in our block properly Right now I'm just working on massaging the thermostat into place. It's kind of like an offset unit as you saw when pulling out the old one. Our goal here right now is just to line up the two bolt holes. These two 10 millimeters get torqued down to 15 Newton meters. I'm going to start them by hand first and make sure that the threads are engaging. And with both of them started, we're gonna go ahead and snug them up and then torque them down to 15 Newton meters. Again, not a whole lot. If you trust the old calibrated wrist, you can just do it that way. But we have the torque wrench out, so we may as well just double check them. Bam, baby. Now we have both 10 millimeter bolts torqued down to 15 Newton meters. We can reconnect all three of our coolant lines going to it. So let's do that now. Now we're gonna go ahead and join our bottom hose first. Remember that clip fell off. We went ahead and added that on before feeding our thermostat back in. This one can be a little bit tricky because there's not a lot of room to work with. Usually you can get away without unlocking these tabs again, but in this case, the fit is so tight. I'm just gonna go ahead and unlock it now. So we have all the help we can to get this hose on since we don't have a lot of room to leverage from. Squeezing your hand in tight between the oil filter housing and the hose will eventually allow you to get a good bite on that to bring it up. And just don't forget to lock your tab in. Here we have it unlocked. Beautiful. Give it a small yank or a good one. Just make sure it's not gonna come out. Make sure your coolant temp sensor didn't get disturbed. This one looks good still, it's still plugged in. Now we can move up to the middle pipe that is held in by a T30. That one, same thing, we lubed up the O-ring with some coolant before feeding it into the housing here. Should make it go in really easy. So now we'll grab our T30 and get that one in once more. All right, we'll start by feeding our T30 in first. Start that one by hand if you can. Now just remember these are going into plastic. You don't need to over tighten them. Just get it until it bottoms out on its own and then that'll be more than tight enough. You're gonna have to help thread this bolt into the new thermostat housing as there's a new housing. Sometimes these don't come pre-threaded. All right, once you get your T30, by hand, then you can go ahead and send it in all the way. Again, remember these are going into plastic. You don't need to over tighten them. Just once they stop on their own and they're snug, that's more than good enough for these T30s. Now we have our T30 in. While we're still hot with it, let's head over to the right side of this pipe and install our M5 triple square bolt. And same deal over here. We're gonna wanna line up our hole as best as possible. We might have to lift this uh, pipe up a bit on the back here just to get that M5 to seat in. Try to start it by hand. Of course, you don't want to cross thread these. They are pesky little bolts 
or screws, whatever you want to call them. Okay, got that started by hand. Now we can switch over to our short extension with the quarter inch drive ratchet. Get that nice, nice and snug up. Same thing, just snugging that up. Now we can swing over our top coolant pipe and get that one in place. And we're just swinging back this upper hose, which I pulled out earlier. Uh, sometimes these are zip tied to the electrical harness. Just cut the zip tie and then you can pull it out and over like we did. Get your alternator wiring out of the way if it's in the way like it is for us. Bam, baby. Once we have the hose on, then we can redo our clamp and get that one situated nicely. Just put the push the hose in until it bottoms out up against the body of the thermostat. Housing. Now we're gonna install our other triple square M5 bolt. Again, this one is holding in the line for the top coolant line that goes into our thermostat assembly. All right, now with that started by hand, we can just snug it up with our quarter inch drive ratchet. All right. With that situated, that means our cooling system is essentially buttoned back up with the exception of our expansion tank cap. At this point, we're going to get our alternator ready to reinstall. And by that, I mean we're going to get those pushings pressed back just a bit so that we don't have to fight it onto our bracket. Uh, with that, I'm just going to take it over to the vise to get those ready. If you want to see, stick along and we'll go ahead and show you how to do that. And then we'll hop back into installing it. My good people, just to give you a really quick overview, an idea of how we get these bushings to go back, all we really need is a hair. Um, you know, the alternative would be filing them down, which we don't want to do. Uh, we're just going to use the vise here. We're lucky enough that our vise is just big enough, small enough to support the alternator with allowing us to get one of the ears in there with the bushing side of it. What I'm using here is a 21 millimeter socket on the back. This is big enough to allow the bushing to go through without blocking it and they'll just allow for some spacing um, for the bushing to come out. We don't need a whole lot, we just need to budge a little bit, and then we'll do the same thing to the other side, and that will allow us to get it back into the car easier. Um, if we remember, we had to pry it out. That's because as you tighten the bolt that goes through, the bushing gets sucked in, pinches up against the bracket on the block, keeping it from rattling, moving around. So we're just doing this to give us our, a little bit less head of a headache when we install it. And with that, you can see, it might be a little bit hard to see on camera, but you can see the fresh exposed metal on the bushing. That's how much we've, that's how much we've had it come up. That's all we need to reinstall it. Um, it's up to you if you wanna push the bushing all the way out, clean them up and then put them back in. It's gonna be a little bit more involved, but for this application, um, this should do for today. So we'll do the other side and then we'll head back over to the car and reinstall it. All right, my good people, now we're gonna feed our alternator back in. And again, if yours still has this rod that holds the P-clamp that keeps the cable, the battery cable aligned in there, go ahead and start with that as we are going to here. I know I said I wasn't going to put it back in, but it's the right thing to do. As annoying as it was to see at the end. So with that, we're going to get it close to the battery cable here. Get that P-clamp on that stud. And we'll get our eight mil I'm using that CTA flexible driver. And I'll use that to snug it up. The goal is to just get your big paws in there or little paws, get this hand started, and then you can tighten it up. Again, this is just, this is holding the battery cable in place. So snug it up and then you'll be good to go. Now with that, we can grab our 13 millimeter nut once more. And we can do our battery terminal end here, our battery cable lead. And we'll get our 13 millimeter nut started by hand. Now we'll put our dust cap back on over the 13 millimeter bolt head. 
just like so. And then we'll take our electrical connector, plug this baby in, and the tab was facing up towards us or towards the outside of the alternator. Beautiful. Now let's line it up and then we'll get the two 13 millimeter bolts started by hand. People, we're gonna stop, start with the top one first. So that's easier. With the top one semi started, we can start the bottom one as well. Once we get them all the way through, we can start them by hand. So we start threading into the bushing end of our alternator. And then we're gonna tie in both of these 13 millimeter bolts down to 23 Newton meters. All right, now what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna back up the bolts a bit and then we'll torque them down properly. And just double check that the alternator has no play, meaning our bushings are doing their job. Now we can go ahead and reinstall our tensioner. So let's get ready to do that. Now, my good people, we're gonna reinstall our tensioner. Again, these are three 13 millimeter bolts that hold it into place. Uh, you're gonna wanna torque those down to 23 Newton meters, just like we did the uh, alternator. Then we're gonna get our 13 down below, which again, you're not gonna really be able to see, but you can feel for it. And then get it started by hand as well. All right, with all three snugged up by hand, now we can take our torque wrench and just torque them down to 23 Newton meters. All right, now that we have our tensioner all bolted up. We can bring our belt back over, get it over our AC compressor, over our alternator. Once we're happy with how it's routed, we can grab our 17 millimeter wrench and remove the locking tool from our tensioner. All right, my good people, at this point, our next victim is gonna be our charge pipe. So we're gonna jack the vehicle back up, or in this case, lift it back up on the lift, feed it up as best as we can, being mindful of our intake boot here, kind of line up everything down below, then we'll come back up here and line up our pipe with our throttle body. So let's do that now. All right, my good people, now we're gonna go ahead and work on feeding our charge pipe back up, uh, being mindful of our electrical connector, which we need to plug in once more once we get it into position. If you have a towel in here like I do, don't forget to take that out before you click it back into the intercooler housing. While we have some play in it, we'll go ahead and get our electrical connector plugged in. There we go. That's nice and locked in. Now for those of you so they cut it in a little bit better shape. You're gonna to wanna to make sure that you reattach your hardware down here for the mounting by the oil filter housing. You may wanna get the boot situated on the throttle body first before you do that so you have some up and down play. So we're gonna go ahead and head back up top and take care of that now. All right gang, we've been wrestling with the charge pipe for quite a bit trying to get it onto the throttle body. We're gonna take a little bit of a different approach. Um, we're gonna remove this uh, hose here from the charge pipe that goes to the noise pipe as my good people like to call it so hopefully we can get a better grip on the elbow get that seated on the throttle body so we're going to take our pliers get that constant pressure clamp off and give that a shot so let's get to it as you can see to the left of the clamp there's the, t the stud that the 10 millimeter nut sits on so we're fighting that at the same time that we're trying to keep this um, up into the throttle body so <laughs> it's kind of a weird uh, sandwich situation going on here so we're going to go ahead and try to remove this clamp to take this elbow off to give us a little bit more room to grip this uh, charge pipe from and now we might have a little bit more oh yeah a little more room to grip this throttle body on 
I just throttle body pipe, sorry, charge pipe to get it onto the throttle body. I'm gonna see if putting the uh, pipe on the stud first will help, and then we can just massage the elbow onto the throttle body. All right, right now I can feel the back of the elbow kind of folding in inside the throttle body. Um, I'm gonna get this secured on the stud a little bit more, maybe even start the nut so it doesn't fall off. And then we'll go around the boot with a pick, see if we can get that to pop out around the throttle body. So let's situate that there for a moment. Let's throw our 10 millimeter nut back on it. Okay, that'll keep it from falling off. And now from the passenger side, we have a better view of the boot. We can try and go ahead and just course this pick around to get this back part of the throttle body intake boot to go onto the throttle body. Yes. All right, my good people, this hook right here, what I was doing behind the throttle body was reaching underneath the actuator here, hooking it into the intake uh, into the charge pipe elbow and then literally just running it with this part of the hook on the outside of the throttle body and this part of the hook on the inside of the boot and just running it around the back side as much as I could. Couldn't see anything, it was all by feel and that was enough to get that folded portion on the inside of the throttle body to pop up and now we can go ahead and just make sure it's seated all the way up and tighten down this clamp using a screwdriver or a flathead screwdriver or a seven millimeter hex. So with that, let's go ahead and tighten this down properly. Keep an eye on the back of the, of the um, clamp. You wanna make sure it's sitting properly. Sometimes they droop down. These little guys can get mangled up. I'm just using the same pick tool from the back to support the clamp. So it tightens evenly all around the elbow here and it's not drooping down on the back by chance. I'm gonna snug that up nice and tight. Beautiful. We can go back to our 10 millimeter nut and tighten that one up all the way as well. Now with that situated on there, we can seat down this 10 millimeter nut all the way while we have all the room in the world. With that elbow out of the way, that was definitely super helpful and crucial to getting this uh, charge pipe back on. We're just gonna snug this down. Now we can put our elbow back on here. Slip it on. And just remember to orientate it roughly like it was, which was something like that. Goes to the noise pipe. And we'll just go ahead and reseat our clamp. I'm gonna try to seat it back on the original markings on the hose. With that situated, before we progress too much further, we're gonna wanna reseat our hard line, again, it was held in by a 10 millimeter nut here and a 10 millimeter bolt above the alternator. So let's do that now. We'll situate this bracket first. Just situate it next to the dipstick. Now let's go ahead and get our nut started by hand first. All right, then we have a 10 millimeter bolt on the passenger side of the intake manifold that we're going to want to put back on as well. And this one's just going into plastic. You don't need to gorilla it on, just snug it up. It's just going to keep the lines in place. That's all we want it to do. And now we're going to switch back to the 10 millimeter socket. Let's squeeze that between these two lines. All right. If you have a charcoal canister equipped on your vehicle, now would be the time to plop that back into place. Now from here, we're just gonna go ahead and reinstall our aftermarket AFE intake. Again, this is gonna be different than your stock airbox. Uh, the stock airbox being a little bit easier, honestly, but we're gonna go ahead and install that really quick. And then we'll pick it back up with reconnecting our battery terminals. And now that we have the items over here situated, we're gonna go ahead and install our aftermarket AFE intake once more. Um, again, you may still have the stock air box. It's going to be a little bit different. 
So just go ahead and pop that back in the same way you got it out. We're gonna install the rubber grommet isolator first, a little bit of anti-seize. Uh, we're actually using liquid moly ceramic paste on those threads so that this does not seize into the air bot or the battery cover again, like the last one did. I'm just gonna use some pliers to snug it up the rest of the way. Not gonna hurt the rubber. And we have two T25s up front that we're gonna install. All right, then we can take our air filter once more and attach that. We're also gonna line up our tab here to sit on the isolator. We'll get a 10 millimeter nut on that after. All right, and now we can do our clamp up top. Again, flathead screwdriver will work or a eight millimeter um, driver like the one that we have today or an eight millimeter socket. Again, stock air box. Don't forget to plug in your mass airflow sensor. Ours has been relocated to the back with this intake and your two clamps if you did both. And while we're here, let's go ahead and reconnect our battery. Take our lid off. We're gonna start with the positive terminal first. 10 millimeter nut. Again, use your wrench or socket on a ratchet. These just need to be snug up. They are just a pinch bolt. You don't need to crank them. The goal here is that they just hug the terminal and they don't move and then you're good. Put your cover back on. Now we'll do our negative terminal. Two tabs in the back. Key those in. And then bring it forward. And this one's a little bit broken, a little bit worse for wear, but you get the general idea, my good people. Now, we're gonna install our noise pipe and then we'll fill this baby up with coolant. Now we're gonna go ahead and reinstall our upper air pipe or noise pipe as some of the good people out there like to call it. We'll go ahead and feed this in like so underneath this AC line. Make sure it lines up over here. You can go ahead and just press that in. There we go. The same thing here. There we go. Then you have two pieces of hardware. Again, our tab is broken here, so we do not have that one, but we do have the other T30, which sits on this bracket right in front of the alternator. All right, my good people. So now at this point, now that we have our pipe situated, everything's good to go. The last thing on our list of things to do is gonna to be to refill the system with coolant. We have the 50-50 genuine mix up at the table. So we're gonna set that up with our UVU system and we're gonna go ahead and fill the system up. Um, I'll let you know if it takes more than the one gallon. And if so, then you may wanna adjust uh, depending on uh, what job you're doing at home, how much coolant you buy. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. All right, my good people, at this time, we're gonna use our UVU vacuum filler tool. This tool is great because not only does it allow you to fill the system without any air bubbles inside of it, but if there is any leaks anywhere, it will not hold pressure, which is a good telltale sign and something you wanna know before you uh, fill your system with coolant. So we're gonna set that up now. It's just a matter of making sure your valve is closed. For those of you that haven't used this tool before, we have a couple DIYs where we use them, but the goal here is to pull vacuum all the way up to the number 25 on our gauge and then give it a few minutes to hold as long as it holds and we know we're in good shape. Um, you obviously want to rule out any leaks on the tool itself. So just keep that in mind. We're going to go ahead and just plop this into place and being mindful here of the angle of the hose, the less stress we can put on the cone here, the better. We're going to put our airline in and now we're just going to go ahead and press the silver tab and pull vacuum. Sometimes if there's a little bit of coolant left over in the system, it will come right back up to the expansion tank. Don't worry about it, not a big deal. Um, I do recommend you keep a small towel around the breather here. So you're not spraying coolant mist everywhere. And another thing to know is we're using shop air to use this tool. However, I've used this tool with a small hot dog compressor at home in my garage. So it should be okay if that's what you have at home. 
Not everybody has shop air. So with that, let's go ahead and pull some vacuum. Now we're just gonna go ahead and feed our hose into the bucket. It's very important that this bucket, um, it's very important that this hose stays at the very bottom of the bucket. If you lift it up at all or it sees any air, then this whole thing is uh, ruined and you've allowed air into the system. So always keep that submerged. Keep one hand on it. Now with the hose submerged, what I like to do is I like to prime the line first. So I'm just gonna crack this open a hair and then close it back up. And then just as insurance, I'm gonna pull a uh, vacuum for like another 10, 15 seconds just to compensate for the air that we let in through that line. And now with that, we can go ahead and just crack the valve completely open, keeping our hose submerged and just waiting until the gauge drops down. And then you'll hear this kind of like release suction. That's when you know it's done. It's also normal to see your hoses collapse if they're visible to you on um, whatever car you may be working on. That's part of the system pulling vacuum. So don't be uh, concerned if you see that. All right, my good people, at this point, our vacuum tool is done doing its thing. We can disconnect it from the air. We can go ahead and lift it up off of our expansion tank. Our car, even though we had obviously extra in the bucket here, we have all the coolant that we would like in the world. We had 9.8 liters to start with, and we ended up with 5.2. So it took less than five liters, which is great. So with the one jug, of the coolant that we had on the table that was more than enough to do this DIY. Um, at this point, all that's left to do is if your level is a bit high, which it is in our case, we're just gonna go ahead and remove a little bit with a syringe, put the cap back on, and then take the car for a test drive and make sure that we have some heat and that it's reaching uh, operating temperature. If you like this video, please be sure to give it a thumbs up. If you have any questions or comments on what we did today, I know this was a kind of pain in the butt job, leave it in the comment section below. Um, I know my hands were blocking a lot of the shots, so if you have any questions, please drop them below. I'll be sure to check them out and get back to you. And if you like this DIY and you want to see more like them, please consider subscribing. We make new ones all the time, along with some fun bits too. Thank you for watching. We'll catch you in the next one.